Thank you very much indeed, Colin. Thank you for the uh, invitation to speak here. I have to say that others have mentioned uh, GCSEs in chemistry as they've stood up and done their introduction. I'm back in O-levels, and I have to say I struggled with all my science O-levels, so I thought the very last place that I would ever speak would be the Royal Society of Chemistry. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity, but I have a concern that today will be the day I will be found out. Uh, so I will see. I'm also stunned by the last two presentations, which uh, I guess are really kind of leading edge technology type presentations that make me feel, as the CEO of Red Tractor, that we're managing really a very old system. Um, and quite clearly, we will need to adopt some of these technologies to come much more up to speed. Uh, I have to say that at the moment, our inspections are done principally by a, a, certi a certification body inspector walking down a farm track maybe every year or 18 months or so and doing perhaps a five hour audit on a farm looking at record keeping and such like. I would love to be able to use some of the technology that, for example, Will has just shown in, in using drones or using blocks chain or whatever in order to get a lot more of that data on a day-to-day -day or even real-time basis and I think that's the way our inspections have got to move because clearly as said when I've listened to the last two presentations I feel that Red Tractor is getting somewhat out of date uh, and will need to speed up. So who are we? Well first of all we are uh, a complete food chain assurance scheme. We're owned by the entire food chain. There are only 18 of us. It's a not-for-profit organisation. It operates independently from our ownership body, which is, as I said, the entire food chain from farmers right through to retailers. Our purpose, it started in 2000, and our purpose then was to provide confidence to consumers that British food was safe and responsibly produced. Our purpose remains exactly the same today. We champion through production standards and as said, we deliver impartial inspections on a regular basis to ensure compliance with those standards. Why do we do that? Simply to provide safe food to our consumers, but the benefit of what we do is that actually our standards underpin British food credentials. Uh, and I say that because when people stand up and say, UK agriculture has some of the best standards in the world, they are probably referring to Red Tractor because Red Tractor covers around 75% of all agriculture in the UK. The only sectors we don't represent are fish and eggs. That also means that we have a consumer-facing logo, uh, of which around 19 million shoppers actually recognise, and 16 are positively influenced. I'm fascinated by the positively influenced, because if I went onto the streets of London and asked 100 people about Red Tractor, I'm sure some of them would say, oh yes, it's something like the shorthand to its British product, and it stands for something positive, but I don't really know what it is. And therefore, later this year, we will actually be, for the very first time in our history, advertising to consumers with the sole purpose of telling them much more about what Red Tractor does and what the benefit is to them. But it also, of course, as a consequence, becomes a major selling point for British abroad. So when we look at our export markets and we think about how you could sell British, we probably don't have price on our side. We probably don't have capacity on our side. But our production standards, our safety and our traceability are all positives. And of course, that is Red Tractor and Red Tractor is uniquely placed to convey those messages. How do we develop our standards? Well. There are lots of sources on this chart. We do sometimes commission our own research. We draw on science and evidence. We're obviously kept very honest by the media and other groups. Uh, we have competitors, etc., and we have our specialist committees, and our committees are vital to us because our committees are both strategic but also very technical, uh, and they are comprised of all of the food chain representatives. And therefore, when we develop our standards, we try to achieve that balance between what the market requires and what farmers and growers can practically and economically and viably achieve. And that's always the balance that we're trying to strive for in developing our standards. 
So in terms of clean growth, I'm going to approach this in reverse. I will talk about growth first of all, and then about the clean aspect. So growth uh, for, the, for us in the agriculture industry really comes from two areas. One, whether we can take a greater share of our domestic market. In Ferguson talked earlier about something like 60% is perhaps produced in the UK, which means we're still importing a lot of food into the UK. So can our agriculture sector actually sell more here in the UK? And of course, the other area is the export markets. And it's probably fair to say that, uh, again, I think Ian mentioned China, we're having some success. And there are one or two pockets of growth outside of Europe. But frankly, at the moment, most of our export business is within the European Union. And maybe there's some opportunities wider than that. Now, because Red Tractor is a consumer-facing scheme, we do a lot of consumer research. We do that here in the UK. When we look at export, we do it in conjunction with AHDB, the Agricultural Horticulture Development Board, as it is their principal responsibility to look at the export markets. So in the UK, when we typically say to a shopper what's important to you, they will come back with price and quality. And quality to them sometimes means the performance of the product on the plate, and at other times it means other things. And when we probe that quality word a little more, they'll come up with some other indicators. So if you took price and, and quality as the 100%, that's an immediate answer as to what I look for, you can see the relative proportions of the other things that are on people's mind when they shop for food and environmental impact at 73 and how it's been produced at 80. It's perhaps interesting specifically for this conference. This was a, an IGD study done in 2016 with a very big shopper panel. The last summer, we followed that up with some very specific qualitative research with consumers. And again, we asked them, once we got past the price and quality aspect, we asked them, other considerations, what is important to you when you buy food? And let's rank those things. And consumers will say, uh, traceability is very important to me. I believe when you demonstrate traceability, you have taken accountability for the safety and the quality of that product. Food safety is key. Anything I'm going to put into my body, I want to know that it's safe. And then where it's relevant and appropriate, animal welfare is important. And then the two areas that are growing in significance and growing very rapidly is both ethics and environment and sustainability. And they both overtake each other depending what's happening in the market. So if you get a really good story about modern slavery, everyone is in the ethics camp. And if you get a very good story about plastics or whatever, then environment and sustainability comes up. But obviously, even though it's ranked, we should still consider these last two at the bottom to be extremely important as people choose food. That's here in the UK. Interestingly, when we ask the same questions of consumers in all of these markets, and this was conducted last August in a joint study by Red Tractor and AHDB. So again, you ask the same question, what is important to you? Interestingly, in these markets, which are the key markets as far as AHDB is concerned, is actually price only comes up first with Japan. And other markets will talk about quality first or even food safety in some instances, which immediately makes me think that maybe the UK has a more appealing market in some of these areas than necessarily in the UK itself. If we go on and look at some of the, st the stats, so um, it, it was around four, just over 4,000 consumers interviewed in those nine different markets. Then something like 53% of all consumers would trust British products to be safe and well known for good quality. And you can see how that varies with extremes, with China being very high on that scale, Japan, though, being considerably lower. <laughs> In, this is an interesting chart as well, that 37% would pay a premium for British food across the whole sample. But again, look at the difference between, say, the Chinese and Indian markets that would probably pay three times what France and Germany would pay for British products. And then I just put this one up last. It just talks about some of those considerations when shopping. And basically, you have a, a minimum country, which Japan features along the bottom of all, the average of the whole sample in the middle, and the upper extremes at the top. So the French, for example, very keen on their own food, and provenance will stand very high at 89%. But if I come over and look at the standards for welfare, for food safety, particularly if it has been treated with hormones or any other kind of chemicals and so on, 
and I look at environmental impact, then you can see the extremes and you can see the averages. So in terms of the export markets, if we were if we were all on a plane to China or India right now, it would probably still be food safety and how that food has been produced that would be absolutely critical in a selling situation. But welfare and environmental impact are still very important and I would suggest growing in those markets. And finally, I would say that, um, again, in those markets, where we have floated the concept of an assurance scheme such as Red Tractor, then actually it becomes a very motivating factor. There's a lot of those markets which are we would see as quite mature markets, but they don't all have assurance schemes such as Red Tractor. And certainly there is an appeal there and a very high appeal, or the appeal goes up with the younger audience. So for me, I think this is an encouraging slide because it suggests to me that with all the issues of Brexit coming, if we do need to look beyond Europe in terms of developing our export business, I believe that there are potential markets out there that are, are, are worth uh, certainly exploiting. So if that's where the growth is coming from, and you can see where consumers are positioning, particularly environment and clean growth, um, then let's look at the element of, of clean and the challenges for, red, for, for agriculture and indeed red tractor. So the government strategy is clear. Um, farming accounts for around 10% of total greenhouse gas emissions. As a, as a sector, it probably ranks third. Uh, after energy and transport. And you can see the strategy is setting out policies to deliver uh, emissions reductions through a whole range uh, of processes uh, and practices. Um, for us, obviously, we have three critical gases, nitrous oxide, which is coming from fertilized agricultural soil and from livestock manure. And I'm sure you all know this chart, so I probably won't talk to it too much. Um, methane, uh, particularly from uh, um, enteric uh, fermentation with livestock. And of course, as, as a lot of the uh, developing markets grow their GDP, then there tends to be a switch to more Western diets. And so it's quite possible that protein-rich diets will grow and this, this will maybe exacerbate the problem. And carbon dioxide, I wish I had some now. I could sell it for, for good prices. Um, less damaging, stays in the atmosphere for much, much longer. But of course, one point we need to remember is that soil is a very good and natural reservoir for carbon, which is why uh, you know, the practice of minimum till or less plowing uh, is there to serve to retain that reservoir. We've had some reasonable success in reducing our emissions over the years. So uh, since 1990 up to 2015, a total of around 17% with some particularly good examples in milk uh, and in pork production. I have to say I would not claim this to be all red tractor. All of the initiatives that you will see tend to be a whole chain initiative in order to get these kind of reductions. But what I can say is a few of the case studies where I believe that the red tractor standard is contributing uh, to that cleaner growth. And one I will start with is what we call integrated crop management. So you can see that to deliver safe, assured and sustainable crops or fresh produce, we have a whole series of things that we look at. And these are all driven by the stakeholders, which are farmers and growers, retailers and food service operators and consumers. So for farmers and growers, adopting ICM will probably reduce their inputs and reduce their costs and give them a much more sustainable uh, uh, production. For retailers and for food service, it kind of guarantees that they've done their diligence in this area. And for consumers, it gives them safe food that is indeed sustainable. And just to give you a few examples from each, so if I took site, soils and rotation, for example, you can see that what we're trying to get to is a soil management plan um, and that's driven by effective crop rotations and, the, and determining the site suitability and so on. It delivers outcomes, which some of which are absolutely perfect for clean growth. And right at the bottom, what I've done is just simply shown a couple of examples of our physical standards that the, the farmer or the grower needs to be able to conform with, which then deliver some of the outcomes that we're looking at. So that would be for site, soils and rotation. For energy, uh, the same. So our outcomes are uh, energy efficiency, carbon reduction. And again, you'll see the standard that the, the farmer would have to deliver in order to be able to meet that standard. 
Um, and similarly with nutrition. So with anything that we're putting on our crops, again, the idea is that we have outcomes such as reduced pesticides, reduced fertilizer, uh, reduced risk of pollution. And again, another standard that, uh, that shows you how we contribute. And similarly in dairy, in dairy we've seen the decline in greenhouse gases, we've seen a reduction in pollution incidents, we are recycling much more waste material from farm, and the lines in red would be the, the one of at least the red tractor standard that is delivering that element. Now I said I wouldn't claim that the reduction in greenhouse gases, the progression to cleaner and cleaner product is all as a result of red tractor, but it is contributing and those standards have to be adhered to. You get a non-conformance against those standards, you have a short time to correct and if you don't then you're suspended uh, from the scheme. So it is critical. In terms of the future, how we then, uh, how we then evolve and develop our standards, we have of course consumer or market expectations, what's actually required and doing the right thing, we have the practicality of implementing at the farmer or the grower level. And I would just, just draw attention to just a couple of things in terms of the practicalities of implementation. I think that one thing that Red Tractor can boast is that from the day it was introduced back in 2000 to today, we have brought farmers on a journey from what was probably in the early days around achieving compliance with legislation to actually now a position where we can claim that we have some world-class standards and world-class production methods. The way that we have done that is through very regular reviews of the standards, typically every three years. So we start the process with a horizon scanning uh, uh, exercise. We do consultation with all the stakeholders, the farmers and growers. We use our science, our best evidence that we've got. We operate within those technical committees. And those incremental improvements have brought farmers and growers on what I would describe as a world-class journey. If you have rapid change that is not always supported by the market or the consumer, it can have drastic consequences for the future. Tim, Ian and myself were talking just before the conference started about pigs. And we were talking way back in the wars days when they had their own specific breeds. I remember in the 90s when the UK pig industry decided that it would end its stall and or it would remove stalls and tethers from its system much earlier than the uh, European legislation. We thought it would be give us competitive advantage, but it was something that wasn't necessarily supported by the market. It probably wasn't understood by the consumers. As a consequence, the market was flooded with much cheaper imports from Denmark and from Holland, and the UK pig industry lost half of its market share, and it still hasn't recovered it yet today. So that's for me as an example of where, some t where you potentially could change those standards rapidly, uh, and it doesn't always deliver exactly what you want. So my, my recommendation is that those short incremental reviews and bringing farmers and growers with you is a, is a very good method. Uh, and I would hope that it, it gives security to British agriculture and keeps it at that world-class level. Colin, thank you. Alan? Okay, I think we'll... Paul? Paul. There we are. Uh, Jim, just a quick question. Um, uh, does the red tractor logo mean that the product is made in Britain? Is it a sort of country of origin scheme as well? Or could you produce uh, pork in the Netherlands to the British standard and still get the red tractor logo on it? It, de it depends a little on the sector, Paul. So if, any, if, it's, if it's anything to do with livestock or poultry, it has to be born, raised, and slaughtered in the UK to get the logo. In theory, the logo could be used at, whilst we're still in the European Union on any product that meets those standards and is audited and so on from the Union. That's under European Union rules or laws. As it happens, in the 18 years that it's been in existence, that has never happened. So Red Tractor has always been with the Union Jack underneath. But certainly for anything that's livestock or poultry, it has to be born, raised and slaughtered in the UK. Thanks. One further question. Oh, this is going to be a tough one, aren't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, I'm sure. Oh. What are the barriers to embracing the digital? Well, I would say 
probably, I'd say probably three things are affecting farmers at the moment um, that are maybe over, raising that barrier or making it more difficult for them to invest in such things. I think one is certainty, one is cash, and one is the capability. I think the certainty, particularly driven by Brexit, is that farmers actually aren't always sure as to where they're going to be in two or three years or whether their market's going to be taken from under them and so on. So are somewhat loath to invest. Fair to say also that in the agriculture sector, margins are pretty thin. So when you combine the uncertainty with the lack of cash, uh, you know, it is difficult to invest in systems. And then I think the third thing is capability. So, you know, I, having been in the food industry all my life, I tend to know that we are in something of an aging workforce. And I think actually a lot of the capabilities that, that Will uh, talked about, for example, they would be difficult to kind of, for lots of the farmers that I've met around the country, a small dairy farmer in the southwest, to ad adopt that kind of technology because probably the capability is not there. Fair to say also the broadband is not there either. Uh, I mean, lots of the farmers in the southwest are still using the Nokia 6210 simply because it's the best signal that you can get. And the battery life's good and you can play snake as well. But, uh, <laughs> but that's where we are. Okay, I think in the interest of time, Jim, once again, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Connie.